Good afternoon, all. This is Shweta from People Matters, and we are back with an exciting session of our virtual session in partnership with Pearson on the topic What's Next? How Advances the English Screening is a Recruiting Game Changer. In this webinar, discover how innovations in English language testing, like measuring intelligibility, fully automated remote monitoring, and customized benchmarking are helping to drive new, efficient, fair, and reliable recruitment processes that will help to improve your acquisition efficiency and quality of hires. We'll also look at results from Pearson English's 2020 Global Snapshot Report and examine the key offshoring destinations, including India and the Philippines, to reveal what the level of English proficiency is really like right now and the impact automated English testing could have. So here's what you will learn. Understanding the unique challenges of recruiting for global employees and why English screening is so important. You know, learning how automated English tests like Worsen address those challenges by offering research-driven screening tools that are fast, accurate, and trustworthy. You know, hear how the Pearson Global Scale of English can help you benchmark English language skills needed and ensure consistency across your global hiring pool. And lastly, discover how automated English tests are modernizing recruiting and L&D programs. I take the pleasure now to invite and introduce the speakers for today. First of all, we have Andrew Khan, who's the Senior Market Development Manager for English Assessment at Pearson and has been with Pearson since 2006. He travels the world meeting with schools, universities, and national governments to help ensure that Pearson's assessment solutions best meet the needs of learners and teachers. A graduate of the London School of Economics, he's based in Rochester, Kent. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you very much, Sveta. Great to have you here. Next, we have Lauren Miller, who's a senior researcher within the academic standards and measurement team within English assessment at Pearson. She has worked for Pearson for a number of years and predominantly within assessment design and standard setting functions. In these roles, she has designed and been responsible for setting and maintaining standards for a wide range of UK and international qualifications using a variety of qualitative and quantitative measures. Originally from New Zealand, Lauren has lived in the UK for 13 years. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks so much, Weta. Great. And lastly, our partner for today's webcast is Pearson. So Pearson Talent Lens is a corporate assessment and learning solutions arm of Pearson. With more than 85 years of global experience in the employee assessment field, Pearson Talent Lens assessment and development solutions are scientifically proven to enhance selection, and development process in organizations and at all stages of an employee's life cycle, you know, right from entry to middle to senior. Its solutions are used for employee selection, leadership development, employee retention, and succession planning, among other users. The Pearson Talent Lens Global Clients list include half of the Fortune 500 companies, expanding small businesses, and all organizations that make identifying the right talent and unlocking employee potential a top priority. So we have saved time for you to ask your questions at the end of the session. For those who are live, they can simply submit or post questions at any time during the session, and we'll try to respond to as many questions as time allows. So without any further delay, let me invite the speakers to take over. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction and to everybody who has joined us today. Uh, I think really what we're looking at today is, as the as the name of the, the webinar suggests, it's what comes next. How are things changing? Um, so we're kind of really looking at that in the context of screening for English, how the market is changing and how assessment is changing with it. Uh, and we'll kick off really with uh, some really inf interesting information about our global report, which is a snapshot of proficiency of, of versant users around the world. Uh, but just before we start, I mean, why are we all here? Why are we all talking about English? I mean, I think these, these statistics will be very familiar to, to everybody on the call or you know, similar statistics like them. So English is, of course, the main language used in the professional and business world. 
It is the dominant language in more than 60 nations. And particularly in, in countries like the US, like the UK, like Australia, it's very often the only language that people in those countries speak. So to be able to communicate effectively with those countries, it, it makes sense for people to be proficient in English. But also increasingly, it's the common language between businesses in different countries that are not traditionally English speaking markets. It's the way they're using it. It's the lingua franca of how people communicate with business. Um, so some statistics here. 40% of employers saying global virtual teams are unsuccessful due to language barriers. 90% of employers struggle with language barriers in day-to-day -day work. 81% of employers say they feel like their company, employees rather, say they feel like their company takes an interest in their professional development, keeps them more engaged if they're offering English training in the workplace. So some kind of background statistics on, on the importance of English, but nothing will, that will, I think will come as a surprise to anybody on this call. What I'd like to do now is hand over to Lauren to take you through a little bit about the, the global scale of English and then dive into the data that's come out of that research report we've done, uh, the, the global snapshot report. So Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Shweta. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce you first uh, to the Pearson Global Scale of English, or GSE. Um, our versant test scores are reported on this scale. The GSC is aligned to the Common European Framework, uh, but the GSC is more granular. The GSC identifies what a test taker can do at each point on the scale across the four skills, that's speaking, listening, reading and writing. There are can-do statements attached to each number, each, each score, on the GSC. Um, the GSC Learning Objectives for Professionals contains these can-do statements that relate to the workplace, and the scale ranges from 10 to 90. Next slide, please. Thank you. I wanted to show you the information on this slide just to try and appreciate the, the time it can take to progress your English language ability. We have on the left, starting the Common European Framework level with the, uh, the Global Scale of English uh, alignments just next to that. Then in the middle, the hours per level that it takes to for, for each level, and the total cumulative. I wanted to actually draw your attention though um, to this column on the right. This is the hours required to make a three point gain on the GSE. This is interesting because you may have someone who is just within a few points of a cut score in your organization, and this could give you the idea of how long it might take them to progress. Uh, conversely, you may have someone who has just progressed um, and they're at that level now, and that's just really a cause um, for celebration of all of their hard work that they've put in to make that progression. Next slide, please. I'd like to take you now through some of the headlines that came out of the Versant Global Report. Um, first, these are the mean scores by region for the Versant English test, which assesses speaking. Now, here at South Asia is performing strongly against the other regions, uh, but it's just behind North America, which includes Mexico, Central America and Southeast Asia. So Southeast Asia, the majority of that cohort is from Philippines, uh, just as the majority of the South Asia cohort is from India. Uh, Asia Pacific trails quite a bit here. Uh, there are large numbers of test takers from China and Japan uh, in, in that particular cohort. Um, next slide, please. These are the uh, mean scores for the Versant writing test, just assesses writing. Now, we can see here that North America is still leading, um, but everything else has sort of shuffled around behind them. Um, that's not unusual. It might just be that different people are sitting these tests, um, or it could possibly be you know, people with, with differing uh, abilities across the skills, and neither is unusual. Um, so we can see here that the Middle East Central Asia is, um, is, is falling behind quite a lot here, but we can see that Asia Pacific has actually moved up a little bit. Um, next slide, please. Now, I think you might find this quite interesting. This is how India compares with other emerging economies. Um, Shweta alluded to this um, in her introduction. So we can see here that Mexico leads with Central American countries immediately following, and India and Philippines are around the middle. And here, China trails 
quite a bit, um, about 10 GSE points behind India. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to where Brazil is. Um, just before we go on to the next slide, we can see that Brazil is, um, is third to last there uh, and is just sort of about five or so points behind India. Next slide, please. So now we see that Brazil is actually leading. And again, as I said before, that you know, we, we might see these kinds of fluctuations. It might be that um, they have more people sitting the, the writing test, different people are using it for, for different job roles in different organizations. It's not that surprising, but it is, it is interesting to see that. Um, we can see that um, Colombia is actually coming sort of quite far down there, but China has moved up quite a bit as well. And again, in India and Philippines are sort of around the middle there. Next slide, please. So these are the mean scores for India for the versant English test uh, that's on the left there in that diagram and the versant writing test, which is the diagram on the right. So we can see that the, the overall, we're looking at the versant English test, the overall mean score was 56. But within that, we have sentence mastery at 61 and pronunciation at 46. And, and that is quite different. So with that in mind, what we are focusing on more um, is intelligibility, um, which essentially is, uh, is this person understandable? Um, but Andrew will be speaking a little bit more on that shortly. Next slide, please. So what do these scores I've been talking about actually mean? I mentioned earlier that there are can-do statements at each point on the GSE, and these are those statements for speaking on the on the score of 56, which is our, our main score on the on the English test for India. You can find these can-do statements in the Pearson Global Scale of English Professional English Guide, and this document can be useful when considering where to place cut scores for different job roles in your own organizations. And just an example here, we can see that uh, a mean score of 56 on the Versant English test means the test taker could already summarize work-related memos or participate in teleconferences using fixed expressions for self-introduction and turn-taking, uh, amongst some others there. Next slide, please. The score of 53 on the Versant writing test, which is our, our mean score for writing um, from our India test takers, includes things like writing a simple summary of factual work-related information, or writing a simple summary of action points from a meeting. Again, this can be really useful when deciding where to place your own cut scores in your own organizations. Next slide, please. So cut scores, let's just talk about those for a little bit. The cut scores are the thresholds that, that you set in your own organizations where you believe the acceptable level of English proficiency is for a particular job role. We surveyed some customers in India and found 24 different cut scores in use across both tests, um, ranging between 51 and 65, that's out of the GSE scale of 10 to 90. The mean cut score was 58, and the modal cut score was 55. And just a reminder that for the English test, the mean score was 56, and for the writing test, it was 53. Um, next slide, please. So, these are from customers in Philippines. They provided cut scores alongside job roles, um, which, which is very interesting. We can see that customer service roles had cut scores that ranged from 55 for roles requiring routine responses and minimal data capture to over 70 for high value customer support. Whereas for technical support roles, cut scores were 70 and above. You might find this uh, useful when uh, deciding where to set your own cut scores, um, but we do recommend that you uh, review the Pearson Global Scale of English Professional English Guide, um, and that when you are setting your cut scores, just to make up your, um, your own minds on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. That's really, really interesting data. Um, that global report is certainly available for everybody to access as well. Um, so we, we can certainly share that with you. So another thing that we obviously do is we speak to employers around the world on a day-to-day -day basis, and we, we learn what their common challenges are. And these were some of the things that really stood out in 2020, um, so, you know, in terms of the things that 
international employers were, were struggling with or they were feeding back to us saying was a problem within their organizations. So one of the key ones is applying the same standards across locations domestically and internationally. Testing when offices are closed, a new problem for 2020. How do you assess people when you physically can't be in the same room as them? Lack of clarity over what standards you should actually be requiring for a particular role, but also what the test scores mean fundamentally. Selecting between candidates with very similar scores for spoken English came up a few times as well. The idea of candidates with spiky proficiency um, profiles, by that we mean people who might be a lot stronger in speaking than writing or writing than speaking. And another one that really came out very strongly, and I think it aligns very much with some of the, the work that uh, Pearson has done on learning and development more broadly, and there's some really interesting articles on People Matters about that, is how do you show the efficacy of learning and development programs with existing staff? How do you show that if you're putting together a program of learning for English, that that's actually having an impact? So some of those things are really came out very strongly last year. Some of them are very kind of long-standing issues, uh, of course, as well. But we're seeing assessment organizations responding to those challenges. And I'll give kind of an overview of how the industry, in my view, is addressing some of those challenges and um, how assessment is really changing to, to meet the needs of those customers, whether they're existing needs or whether they're new needs. Now, this is a really interesting one. It's, it's applying consistent standards across uh, different locations. You imagine a company has an office in South Africa, an office in Russia, an office in India, but they might be speaking to people in a customer service role, for example, in the US, in the UK. That would be you know, quite a common scenario. It's also common you know, within a country to have an office in one place, another office in another. How do you ensure that the standards that you're applying are consistent? Now, that means consistent in terms of fairness for the people you're interviewing, but it also means consistency in terms of guaranteeing a good customer experience. And I'll give you kind of an example from a traditional assessment background. If you look at, for example, um, we'll say Greece, you've got people who are doing interviews with, with people either in an assessment context or in a job interview context in Greece. And you've got somebody who is doing the interview, maybe a native English speaker, but they've lived in Greece for, for many, many years. So when that person comes in for interview and they're speaking with a very, very strong Greek pronunciation of English, they're making the same sort of mistakes that uh, the Greek learners very often make when they're translating things literally from Greek to English. Uh, they're speaking with a particular pattern of speech that is very common in Greece. That's something as an interviewer, because you've been immersed in that situation for a very, very long time, you're familiar with, you're comfortable with, and you might understand them in a way that a customer who might be in a different country would not necessarily understand them. So how do you ensure that your judgment, your subjective judgment aligns with the judgment of the customer, uh, kind of the, the standard judgment of somebody who may not be familiar with that scenario? It can actually also work against uh, potential employees or potential test takers as well. So, I mean, if you're looking at one of the, the big international gold standard exams around the world, um, I was speaking to some, some guys in, in Bangladesh uh, a couple of years ago, and they were saying that they were planning to get on a plane and fly to Dubai to take their test. Now, why would they do that when the test is the same, the format is the same, the assessment standards in theory are going to be the same? And the answer they gave me was that if I walk into my test center in Dhaka with my very high level of English, and the person before me has a very high level of English, and the person after me has a very high level of English, I don't stand out. I'm nothing special. If I make a small mistake, the examiner is going to notice that really, really easily. If I get on a plane, fly to Dubai, where people taking this test have a much lower level of English, I look amazing. I look like the best person they've seen that week. I'm more likely to get a high score, or at least there's a perception that they're going to get a higher score. But again, it's, it's the subjective view of the examiner that makes it really challenging because you, you're not necessarily treating people 
alike and you're not necessarily applying the same standards from location one to location two. How do you get around that? One of the ways you can get around that is with computer scoring. So taking that human subjectivity, taking that human bias out of the equation and making sure you have uniformity in standards. With computer-based testing, doesn't matter which country you're taking the testing, you're always going to be judged along the same lines and it's held to the same standards as everybody else around the world. So I think that's something that we are likely to see a lot more of as we go forward. Pearson's been doing it for a long time. I think other companies will be moving in this direction as well. Another major challenge for the last year is, of course, testing when offices are closed. Now, we hope very much that things will start to get back to normal uh, this year. But you may still have a situation in which you do not want people to, to travel into your office location for interview. Um, and that might, be, that might be something that's permanent now. Maybe you don't want to have everybody coming into the office. You want to have some kind of measure of their level of English before they get to interview stage but allowing them perhaps to take a test from home. And the big challenge there. And a lot, of, a lot of employees, I would say, would just say, okay, you take the test, I trust you. Um, but there is always that risk that somebody, if they're taking it in a home environment, if they're taking a test when they're not being checked, they're not being monitored, might do something dishonest. So the, the, the question is always, how do I know you took the test and you didn't get your cousin who speaks English better than you to take the test for you? One of the things I think we're likely to see a lot more of going forward is the use of remote proctoring or remote monitoring technology to help ensure that test takers are not cheating. So I, I, I think of these as two different things. So remote proctoring, I generally think of as somebody who is live watching you take that test via a video link, making sure that you're, you're not doing anything untoward. Remote monitoring, I see as very much a technology-based solution. So using artificial intelligence to have a, a record of how that person is taking the test, but to also raise red flags if anything looks suspicious. So is this person the same person that's supposed to be taking the test? Is there another person on screen, for example? And I think that one of the big differences, of course, is the, the price point and the accessibility, uh, the scalability as well. So remote monitoring, I would say, very often offered at a lower price point, but offers a lot more flexibility in terms of when those tests can be taken because you're not scheduling time with somebody to, to monitor that person in, in real time. Another, I mean, it's a huge, huge issue, of course, is, is lack of clarity on what test scores mean. Different tests have different score scales, and that's not easy necessarily to relate back to the skills that potential employees need to have. So very often people who are working in, in a, you know, a business context, an enterprise context, might be familiar with the common European framework reference. So you might know B1, B2, whatever it might be, and you can set your, your expectations aligned to that. But different companies have different interpretations of what the CEFR means. So you have you know, different score scales for different tests. So you, know, you might have a B1 plus in the CFR that might be broadly the same, roughly the same as you know, 51 on the GSE, 6.0 on IELTS, 77 TOEFL IBT, 140 TOEIC speaking. Now, for me, it's difficult to keep all that together in my head. And I've been working to get, you know, I've been working in English assessment for 15 years. For a teacher, it's challenging. For somebody who's working in an HR context or who's working in an operations context within a company, these are just numbers very often. This is just numbers and letters. What does it actually mean? I think that's one of the really, really challenging things. How do I know that the standard I'm setting is equivalent to the standard I'm going to get from another test or a certificate that somebody already holds. And again, I think we've touched on it a little bit with the global scale of English, but what I would expect to see is a lot more of that from assessment companies in the future, linking score scales to specific tasks that the learner can achieve. So it stops being a number and it starts being, if somebody has this number, this is what they can do. And I think the other really key thing is benchmarking. So the first thing when I'm doing sales training for my colleagues who are in Pearson, the first thing we always get clear is that we are not selling products. Assessment is not a product. Assessment is a service. It is a solution. So the, the sale does not end until the person who you've given that test to 
understands the score that's come back after somebody's taken that test. So it's about working with organisations to set appropriate scores. It could be a formal benchmarking exercise. It could be advising on different job categories based on our experience or the company's experience. So again, I think that that's something we're going to see a lot more of, people framing assessment very much as a service, as a solution, and not as a product that you buy off the shelf and then you're left to implement yourself. Big, big challenge is how do you, how do you choose between two people who have basically a very, very similar score when it comes to uh, their overall uh, speaking score, for example? And you can have a same score, you know, say 56 on, on the global scale of English, but you can approach that score, you can achieve that score in different ways. You might have a higher vocabulary uh, score than you have with oral fluency. You might have better grammar uh, than you do with pronunciation, as an example. So how do you actually take that overall speaking score and align it to what your job role actually needs? I think one of the things that we've, we've obviously done with our test is to look at sub skill scores. So giving you some information as to how that speaking score is put together. So you can say, well, you know, the most important thing for me is oral fluency. I don't care so much about pronunciation. Pronunciation is something we can work with, we can improve over time, but the ability to speak uh, fluently is the most important thing for me. And then you can start to look at those sub-scores and choose between people who have a similar sort of score. And another one I think is something that we're likely to see a lot more of is focusing on the idea of intelligibility. So intelligibility as a new kind of sub-score, a new kind of skill category. So what do we mean by intelligibility? So you can imagine these, these two people have the same GSE score. They both have a score of, let's say, 65. So Jose has very, very good grammar and vocabulary, but he drops consonants when he's speaking and he speaks with a very unfamiliar rhythm to a native English speaker. So even though they've got you know, some very strong technical abilities with English, they may have a low intelligibility because of the pattern of their speech and the way that they're speaking. Neha, on the other hand, may have a strong accent and maybe a stronger accent than Jose but she speaks at a rate that is appropriate for the audience that she's speaking to, and she enunciates clearly enough. And that means native English speakers can kind of get used to the idea of the accent, but they can understand her much more easily, and she has a high intelligibility. So I would expect intelligibility to be a bigger feature of, of English speaking tests uh, going forward as well. Another challenge, as we, as we kind of saw with the global report, is there are countries where people may have a much stronger speaking score than a writing score or the other way around. And there are all sorts of different reasons for that. One might be the, the degree of similarity between your alphabet and the, uh, the Roman characters in the English alphabet. Another is the way that people learn. So if you're learning in a context that prioritizes spoken English, then your speaking score is likely to be higher. In some countries, though, there's a much stronger focus on grammar, on the construction of sentences, and writing tends to be a little bit stronger in those situations because they don't work as much on pronunciation and oral fluency. If you're an employer, how do you know that somebody is going to be able to communicate effectively across multiple modalities? It might be speaking to people on the phone. It might be speaking to people face-to-face -face in business meetings. It might be email. It might be chat. One of the ways you can do that potentially is to look at using four skill tests. So when we speak about four skills, we speak about listening, reading, speaking, and writing. So getting an overall picture of somebody's proficiency, moving away from perhaps focusing just on spoken English proficiency and looking more broadly at the, the, you know, the, the wider ability that person might have. And another real challenge that we've come across um, is, is that kind of idea of showing efficacy of learning and development programs. So you have a lot of employers that, you, do, you know, you've, you've identified that there's a gap when it comes to English. You've identified that your, your team doesn't have the level of English that it you know, requires to communicate effectively with customers or internally. 
do you start again? Do you say goodbye, everybody, and hire new people? No, of course you don't. You want to work with those people to improve the level of English that they have to ensure that they're going to be functioning at peak effectiveness. So learning and development becomes really important. But, you know, you can have a learning and development program for English. How do you check that it's actually working? How do you see re actual results? How do you have an intervention potentially if some things are working and some things are not working? So I see very much the idea of benchmark testing being a, a new thing that people are going to be adopting a lot more. The idea of a test that you can take at the start of the course, the middle of the course, and at the end of the course to see how things are changing. But to me, that's a missed opportunity if you're only looking at the scores. If you're only looking, this person's gone from 56 to 58 to 61, that's useful, it's good information. But what's actually, to me, more interesting is, okay, this person is at 58, halfway through their, their course, what should they do next to get to 61? So it makes it easier to track the efficacy of those learning and development programs, but it can also feed into those learning and development programs to really give a sense of structure, a sense of guidance and helping people on their way. And that's something I think that Again, I would expect within the, the English assessment uh, business, the English assessment industry, to have much more of a focus on going forward. I can just take you through now a little bit about how Pearson has approached solving these problems. And this is not, this is not the only way to, to approach solving those problems at all, but this is how we've done it ourselves. And I th hopefully it will give a little bit more context. So one of the things things we've done, of course, is with the Versant English test is to use the idea of automated scoring of, of speech, writing, listening, and, and um, reading as well. Uh, so that really addresses the idea of applying the same standards across locations domestically and internationally. You can have a cut score as a company that you can apply across the entire world. You know that if somebody's taking a test in South Africa, then they're going to be performing at the same level if they have the same score as somebody in, in Russia, in Greece, in India, wherever it might be. So we use those automated scoring engines. We say you know, results come back very quickly as well. It's another advantage over traditional methods of testing. We have results that come back within about five minutes. And as I say, it means you, you know, you, you, you're, you've got fairness for those uh, potential employees. You know that they're, they know that they're being assessed in the same way as everybody else. But it also enables you to say all of that human subjectivity, all of the human biases that can come into play when I'm selecting between candidates across different locations ceases to be an issue. Solving the problems of selecting between candidates with similar scores and lack of clarity over the standards required and what test scores mean. We've actually recently updated our, our Versant English test score report. Now, again, the Versant English test is the test that focuses on uh, facility with spoken English. Uh, we do have other tests that focus on four skills. We have other tests that focus on writing as well. But we're looking just at the, the Versant English test score report as an example. So you do have those sub-scores for sentence mastery, vocabulary, fluency, and pronunciation. Really importantly, they're all on the global scale of English. So you have those detailed descriptions of those language capabilities linked in to those global scale of English can-do statements. We also have some suggestions for improvements, but the big one for me, the new one that we've introduced over the last six months, is the intelligibility score index. So the global scale of English goes from 10 to 90. The intelligibility score index goes from one to five. And it's really designed to give that additional piece of context if, you're, if you've got somebody with a very similar score to somebody else, how well can they be understood by a native English speaker? What does their score mean when it comes to being understood? And it's an additional piece of context. You can see you've got an intelligibility score of four for this learner who has a score of 59. So an innovation there that we've introduced uh, that really speaks to the idea of how well can somebody be understood by native English speakers? And Lauren's mentioned a lot about this already, so I won't spend too much time on this, but I think the, the global scale of English is a, is a real game changer for us as well. It takes away the idea of, of scores being in the abstract. 
it is not an abstract number anymore. It's linking back to what somebody can actually do with English. And we've got some examples here. So a score of 56 can ask for confirmation or understanding during a live session or presentation, can summarize and comment on a short story or article and answer questions in detail. Now, these are all in our searchable database. These are all resources that you can access for free uh, via our website, english.com. And it really just takes, as I say, that abstract score, that abstract number, and makes it more concrete. And that is useful for teachers, but I think, to me, that's particularly useful for people who, who don't have a, a background with, with English assessment, who don't have a, a background with English teaching, people who, who might be in HR, who might be in operations, just need to know if somebody comes to me with this score, what that score means, but also if I'm setting a score within my organisation, what sort of score should I be looking at? So the challenge with the, the Common European Framework is that you do have those can-do statements in there. There's not actually that many of them, and certainly not many of them that are relating specifically to work. The ones that are in there are really heavily weighted as well towards the, the speaking skills rather than the other skills you might be looking to check. So what we've done with the Global Scale of English is to expand on that CEFR, to build it out uh, to put some more detail on it. So it's not designed to replace the CFR, the Common European Framework that people are very often familiar with. It's designed to build upon it, make it more detailed, make it easier to track learning as well, but to really put some concrete can-do statements, what a person can actually do with English behind that as well. And again, I, I would, as I say, expect other organisations to be doing similar things. I've seen one or two steps in this direction from other testing providers uh, myself as well. Spiky profiles showing efficacy of learning and development programmes, the kind of other problems that we touched on. We offer four skills tests. Um, so we offer two different four skills tests, and those are kind of designed to be appropriate for the different contexts you might be using those in. So if you're in that, in that um, screening situation, you're screening people for interview, you do not want a long test. You want the shortest possible test that will accurately measure somebody's listening, reading, speaking, and writing. And for us, that's the Versant Four Skills Essential Test. So it's, it's 30 minutes versus the 15 or so minutes you'd have with the speaking test. So it's still short enough to be useful in that interview context or pre-interview context, but gives you an overview, a speaking score, a reading score, a writing score, and a listening score. If you want to go beyond that, if you're looking into the, particularly into the learning and development area, we've also got that, the new Verse and Professional English test, which is something that we've actually launched uh, just uh, in the last month. So that gives you a very detailed four skills report. It's a longer test, it's 60 minutes long. The idea is that it gives you a score, but it also gives you something to build on with that score. So it gives you learning uh, objectives, it gives you recommendations for future study. This is the test, I would say, if you're using it against a learning development program. You've got your test at the start, test in the middle, test at the end. This is the test that I would be using in that context. It gives more detail, and it gives you some guidance on where to go next. The other problem we discussed, of course, is testing where, when offices are closed. Uh, we've seen this uh, not just within the, you know, the corporate space, but also with universities as well. How do you actually check somebody's level of English, make sure they're not cheating uh, if they're taking tests from home? So what we've done at Pearson is partner with an organisation called HirePro, uh, very, very uh, well regarded, very long standing uh, Indian company in this space uh, to roll out the idea of remote monitoring internationally for our person tests. So it's fully AI powered. So as, uh, as, a, as a customer, as a, you know, an organization, a university or a business, you would have the ability to view the recording of that person taking the test. But the AI system flags up anything that looks suspicious. So we've seen this example, um, you've got somebody else on the screen. The AI system will, that's a red flag, that will be sent to you to review. You've also got here, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, you've got a facial match. So this is a, a photograph uploaded from that learner prior to taking that test. This is the actual person taking the test. And you can see there's a 0% match. This is not the same person. Red flag, that gets escalated to, to the people who are reviewing that test within your organization. 
So it's designed to be scalable, not too expensive, uh, but to give you a, an additional measure of security when it comes to delivering tests. This is the growth area for, for, uh, for English assessment businesses all over the world. Uh, we're seeing other big, big companies getting uh, in, involved in this space as well. Uh, this is the way that Pearson has done it with the AI powered, uh, scalable, inexpensive, we would say, uh, solution with our partners at HyperPro. So that is kind of the overview of, of what we've been uh, looking at in terms of the changes in the market and the, the changes when it comes to, to assessment. Uh, if you want to know more, you can always check out our website at uh, talentlens.in or versanttest.com. All of those fantastic GSE learning objectives for professional English are at pearson.com. Um, so you can check that out. This is all free to use. There's no, you know, there's no cost associated with those GSE learning objectives. So that's something you can have a, a deep dive into. But of course, you know, working with Pearson colleagues, we will work uh, through that with you. We can certainly offer that benchmarking service as well. Well, again, we think of assessment as a solution. It is a service. It is not a product that you buy. So it's a, it's a partnership very much with the organizations that we work with. And whether that's partnership on delivery, whether that's partnership on learning objectives, where do we go next? we're always here to help. So that, I think, is really the, the end of the presentation. Hopefully, it's given you a flavor of, of how things are developing in this market. I'd love to take any questions that, that people might have. Great. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Lauren, for all your great insights. Uh, it was a very insightful session. I think we'll take up a few questions now from the audience. So. Uh, one question that came up was, how do we use Versen's course to make our hiring or selection decisions? If you could just give you know, three pointers. Absolutely. So again, I, I've said this a lot, but it's a partnership. So what we would do is work on a consultancy basis with you to really make sure that you're setting scores that are meaningful for the job roles that you're looking to recruit for. So our, our colleagues uh, from, from our team, uh, would give you the experience of other companies within your within your sector to really also kind of work with you to understand what you're aiming to achieve with the uh, with the hiring decisions. What kind of profile are people going to be you know, speaking to? Is it high value customers? Is it technical support versus something else? So that's certainly something we can do. We can also take you through the, those learning objectives and those can-do statements on the global scale of English as well. So really giving some context of what a score of 56 means versus a score of 59. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, the, the key thing is consultancy. It's working with you to set a score that is right for your organization and being responsive if you have any, any questions or queries or doubts coming back from that as well. Great. Thanks, Andrew. I was also curious to know, you know, that uh, are there certain kind of industries which should which you highly recommend should kind of, you know, uh, do the scoring to kind of, you know, set standards for, you know, their global team? Like, are, is there a particular industry that you would say would definitely, you know, benefit kind of the most from these uh, scores? Yeah. It's a really, really interesting question. And I think that that is, that's changing a little bit now. So historically with, with tests like this, and certainly with the and it has been, it's been you know, BPO, it's been call centers, it's been the idea of being able to communicate very efficiently with people who are native English speakers, phoning up for customer service, uh, for service roles. And that's still very much the case. That's still a really important use case. But what we're seeing now is, is changes. I mean, I think as the market develops, as I think particularly companies in India move away from BPO, move away from call centers, move towards those more value adds uh, roles as well. So it could be edtech. Edtech is a really big one for us now. How do you ensure that somebody who is going to be communicating with a learner who is uh, maybe studying maths, history, coding, whatever it could be, they can actually have the level of English they require to be doing that effectively. Uh, we see hospitality as a really big growth industry as well, as the expectation uh, that more people will be communicating with, uh, with people in English grows. Hospitality is a big one. Uh, we also see a lot of growth in the idea of um, basically, you know, high value customers. 
So, you know, when you've got that kind of really platinum standard customer service experience, maybe setting a higher score than you might otherwise have done uh, for, for other kinds of interactions. Um, but we're, we're growing in, in technology as well. We're growing tech support. To me, the simple question, the simple answer to that question is anytime you need to communicate effectively in English, there is going to be a versant test and a versant score that enables you to know that somebody's going to be able to do that. So I see applicability across all sorts of different sectors, uh, but those are certainly some of the ones that we see particular demand in at the moment from the customer side. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for answering that. We have a very interesting question coming from Dhanur, who's asking, uh, do you check for MTI? And does the report also provide audio files for review? Uh, does the report help with benchmarking? Um, so MTI, I'm not familiar with. Uh, uh, the mother tongue influence, basically. Ah, right, right. No, no. So I think there's there's a couple of things that we uh, we uh, we look at here. So one of them is, I'll start with the question about the the audio files. There there is an audio sample certainly with the Versant in English test uh, that you can listen to, and that gives a little bit more context for how that person is speaking. Um, but uh, it also helps you understand, you know, is there an issue with the the microphone? Maybe this the recording's not so good. Uh, you can also check, obviously, does that voice match the person who is, is supposed to be taking that test? So we do have audio files that you can listen to. It's not the whole test because that item bank is very, very secure. We don't want everybody to have access to what those items on those answers would be. But certainly there's a sample in the verse English test that you can listen to on the open questions. What we think about in terms of, I mean, we, we, we test people around the world in, in the same way. So what we do is we check for uh, essentially the content of their answers, we check for pronunciation, and we check for all fluency. So when we're talking about uh, things like accent, that is something that, you know, whatever else it might be, is really seen in the context of, are you able to understand as a native English speaker what that person is saying? So we we always look at it in terms of uh, you know, intelligibility foremost. Um, but it's actually really interesting because the, the needs of customers vary according to the market. So we actually have a verse in English test specifically designed for India, where you have a context of people who are going to be communicating with, a, with an Indian idiom uh, when they're speaking to customers, where that is the expectation. So there's okay. the sorts of things that we do. Great, great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, one more question that came up was, does Versant also, the test also measure comprehension? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I th think very much that it, it certainly does measure comprehension. You can't get a good score on the Versant test without being able to understand what you're being asked and be able to respond appropriately to that. So content is a huge part of that. And it tests comprehension in different ways according to the different item types that we have. So there are very, very simple ways to check comprehension. So one of them is you know, short answer questions. Um, the, the example we sometimes give is, what is frozen water called? And the, the person who's answering that test would say ice. So it's not a, you know, not a general knowledge question, it's a vocabulary question more than anything else, but it's also a, a comprehension question. If you do not understand the question that you've been asked, you can't give the, the correct answer. Another way of doing it is maybe a little bit more subtle. So one of the items we've got in the verse in English test as well is the sentence repeat question. So you listen to a sentence and you say that sentence back. Now you might think, well, that doesn't check comprehension, that checks memory that checks the ability to take in information and repeat it exactly. And I can understand why people might think that, but it's actually almost impossible to sentence back of seven syllables or more without understanding what that sentence means. So what the way that we always think about it is, if I'm answering a question, I'm not replicating the sounds that people are making, I'm replicating from my, my language resources the meaning of that sentence. And it's, it's a, another check on comprehension. It's another example of how comprehension is measured. 
in in the English test, but maybe in a, in a slightly less traditional way than people might think about it. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Another question that came in was, uh, what happens if the responses are in another language? Does Wilson score that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's a question that very much aligns with my way of thinking, because anytime I'm taking an English test that's automated computer scored, my first instinct is, let me see if I can break it. Let me see if I can take this test in Russian or French and get a score. And it's 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 an interesting one. Certainly, we would say you cannot get a good score on the first English test uh, if you're speaking in a foreign language. We do have a lot of non-scorable uh, results that come back and almost all the non-scorable results, either somebody's got their microphone turned off or they're speaking in another language. So you're not doing enough in terms of the responses that you're given to register on that score scale. I wouldn't completely rule out the possibility that you could speak in a foreign language, but speak with the correct intonation, the fluency required to at least get a non-zero score. So you might get a very, very, very low score if you're speaking a foreign language. It's unlikely, but it could happen. What you certainly wouldn't get is a score that would get you, uh, you know, uh, you know, into the kind of uh, the, the higher levels or even the lower, mid to low levels. It would be a very, very low score, but you might potentially trigger some some score points just based on all fluency, pronunciation, intonation, the pauses between your words. But again, you're, you're not going to get a score that anybody's going to look at uh, for uh, for employment, for, for anything else. It would be a very, very low score. In the majority of cases, it would be no score at all. Great. Thanks, Andrew. One question about the scores, you know, when we were uh, shown the charts of different countries, how often you kind of keep revising them or they are kind of set in stone? Uh, what is the criteria, basically? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And what we would say is that the question bank is always being revised. It's an ongoing living thing. Um, so there's a couple of ways we do that. We go through periods where we, uh, we put in a lot of new questions. Um, so we, we go, it's it's a complicated process because when you're doing these questions, it's not just about writing those questions, it's training the artificial intelligence system to mark those questions. That's what takes the, the most amount of time, and that's what certainly takes the most amount of resource as well. Um, but we do that uh, periodically, so we have a refresh of the item bank. But we also look at how those questions are performing. So we can see if somebody's overall score, for example, if the average overall score is, is X, but the a particular item is not really performing as it's intended to do. So that has a different score. It's out of line with the overall scores that people are getting. That could be for a couple of different reasons. And we might take a view of that, that question is not performing as we want it to. So take that out of the item bank and put something else in, in its place. But very much it is a, it's a living thing. It's an ongoing uh, process uh, with all of our automated score tests. And we would constantly refresh those item banks. And the research projects as well that we do go on in the background. So whether that's research obviously as into how the test is performing, whether it's the global report, that's something we would also do on a periodic basis as well. Great, great. Thank you, and thanks for answering all these questions. I think we're almost done with all of them. So mm -hmm. I think with this question and answer session, we are going to wrap up today's session. And once again, I would like to thank our today's partner, Pearson, and our speakers, Andrew and Lauren, for the invaluable information that they have shared with us today. Thank you, and have a great day. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Lauren, once again. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody. Thank you thank very you. much.